start. So friends, students, colleagues, good afternoon, good evening, and ohayou gozaimasu in Japan. I'm Yves Tibergen, Professor of Political Science and Co-Director of the Center for Japanese Research at UBC. And I welcome you to this. Uh, uh, the webinar will focus on Japan's response to COVID-19 from a political and historical perspective with Professor Koichi Nakano, who is kindly joining us from Tokyo today. Before going further, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the ancestral, traditional, and unceded territories of the Muskiam, Squamish, and tsleil people, as well as the Wassanek people, who have called this area home for many thousands of years and continue to do so today. Since we're on a virtual platform, I'd like to invite you to reflect upon the indigenous lands that you're on today as well. And a good online resource to do so in Canada is nativeland, native-land.ca. I would like also to give special thanks to our wonderful CGR research and event assistant, Saya Soma, uh, who has spearheaded the organization of this event again, and who does it always brilliantly and uh, flawlessly. So I have a few logistical announcements before uh, I announce, I, I present the speakers. First, the chat function has been disabled. So questions should be asked in the Q&A window and they will, uh, you know, they will go up and I will see them and later ask them to, uh, to the two speakers. Um, please also note that this webinar and following Q&A questions will be recorded. We will make it available on UBC's SPPGA and CGR websites. Um, You're not required to use your camera or microphone to participate in a Q&A session. Written questions can be submitted to everyone via the Q&A function and upvoted by you. I'll monitor the Q&A window and post questions using attendees' first names only. So now I'm very, very pleased and honored to introduce uh, the speakers. And I'll start with our main speaker, Professor Koichi Nakano, uh, who is Professor of Political Science at the Faculty of Liberal Arts of Sofia University, Jochi Daigaku in Yotsuya. Uh, Professor Nakano specializes in the comparative politics of the advanced industrial democracies particularly Japan and Europe. And in fact, he knows a lot about France and the UK in particular and speaks French. Uh, also focuses on uh, political theory. He has a BA in philosophy from Todai, another BA in philosophy and politics from Oxford, and an MA and PhD in politics from Princeton University. In fact, we had the luck of meeting uh, when he was doing his PhD and I was doing mine uh, as well in the US. Uh, Professor Nakano's research has focused on a variety of uh, issues of contemporary Japanese politics from comparative, historical, and philosophical perspectives, including questions of neoliberal globalization, nationalism, the Yasukuni problem, language, media and politics, amakudari, and administrative reform in Japan, decentralization, the cross-national transfer of policy ideas, and a review of the DPJ government. Uh, is incredibly prolific and has, has written on all those topics, books, articles uh, that are well known. Uh, in English, he has published uh, in the journals such as Journal of Japanese Studies, Asian Service, Pacific Review, Governance, etc. Uh, and um, several books, including uh, the last one, co-edited volume, Disasters and Social Crisis in Contemporary Japan, Political, Religious and Social Cultural Responses, uh, and that was from Palgrave Macmillan in 2015. Uh, he has published many other books in Japanese, and there's a good list of them uh, on different topics uh, of contemporary Japanese politics. Uh, and he's often cited whenever, uh, you know, the International Herald Tribune or BBC or The Economist, New York Times, need uh, a voice on Japanese politics, they often uh, go to Koichi Nakano, who is always busy in his office. Um, so it's really uh, wonderful to hear uh, Koichi Nakano's uh, insights today. Uh, I will also introduce our discussant, uh, Ying Chou Kuang, who is PhD candidate in the Department of Political Science here at UBC. Uh, and Ying Chou specializes in Northeast Asian comparative political economy with interest in China, Japan, and Korea. Ying Chou's research focuses on the role of emerging powers in global technology governance, global technology standard setting and technology standard uh, competition with a focus on Japan, China, and Korea. 
She has also uh, been working as a research fellow at the Vancouver-based think tank, the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada. Before joining UBC, Ying Xiu completed her undergraduate study at uh, Peking University in China, and also had a double bachelor's degree at Waseda University in Japan, and an MA at UBC before uh, getting into the PhD. Um, so Ying Xiu will be able to offer some uh, comparative uh, observations uh, and questions uh, regarding Japan and COVID, but in the context of the region as well. Um, so without further ado, I'm now going to turn the podium to uh, Professor Koichi, an old friend of 23 years. So it's great pleasure having you here, UBC. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yves. And uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And uh, I'd like to also thank um, Inchu, but also uh, Saya, uh, for giving me this uh, wonderful opportunity. And uh, yes, I mean, it's very good to get reconnected with Eve, even though it's online. Uh, we are not getting any younger, but we are still, I guess, healthy and, well, more importantly, surviving during the pandemic. Um, so uh, I'd like to spend the first 30 minutes or so. I try not to go for too much longer uh, in presenting my views so that we can have plenty of discussions, starting with uh, Inchu's comments. Uh, please allow me to screen share. Um, I hope you can see okay. So the uh, title is Japan's response to COVID-19 uh, from a political and historical perspective. Uh, well, first an overview on Japan and COVID-19. Um, Japan is known to have the lowest level of infection and mortality numbers uh, among the uh, G7 countries. Um, and so it's been seen as having done so far quite well. Uh, but when you look at the uh, Japan standing uh, in the Asian context or compared to Oceanian societies uh, like New Zealand and Australia, uh, it does look rather more mediocre uh, in standing, uh, not doing as well as, let's say, Taiwan or South Korea uh, or Vietnam, although, of course, these societies too are seeing a new surge in the uh, COVID infection with the variants. Um, well, Japan also is doing uh, not as good as it used to during uh, the year 2020. Over 80% of COVID-19 death uh, has occurred since December 2020. Uh, and that is also the reason why a lot of people, as you may know, are opposed to uh, Tokyo hosting the Olympics uh, in, in, a, in, a, well, in, less than, well, in, uh, in less than two months now. Um, there has been four waves of infection surge and three states of emergency uh, to date uh, in Japan. And currently, uh, Tokyo and Osaka and some of the other uh, prefectures are under the state of emergency, uh, extended for the second time up until uh, the 20th of June at the moment. Um, well, what also is noted about Japan is that it has very few PCR tests. Uh, it conducts very few PCR tests. And uh, even today, uh, I think, you know, on, on, a, on a day like in Tokyo area, when there are many tests that are conducted, uh, it's still fewer than uh, 1,500 uh, tests per day. Uh, uh, sorry, 15,000 uh, tests per day. And sometimes, uh, like on a Sunday, uh, there are only about uh, 1,500 tests, uh, and which makes Japan uh, second lowest in terms of PCR tests conducted uh, on a regular basis, uh, second only to, I think, uh, it was Mexico, which had the lowest number. So uh, what that means is that a lot of people think uh, that the actual infection numbers, at least, are much worse than what is known in Japan uh, in terms of official record. Um, Japan is also noted for not having really a hard lockdown. So even though there is state of emergency right now, schools are open, uh, many people commute to, uh, to work, uh, and uh, also uh, the um, commercial facilities are open. Um, there are um, restrictions in terms of the opening hours and particularly sort of closed at night and alcohol is uh, not being served in drinking places in principle, uh, but it's a very soft lockdown uh, we are talking about here in Japan. 
Uh, the other thing that is increasingly noted is that Japan has very low uh, or slow vaccination uh, rate. Uh, and um, I think even among the elderly population uh, who are now getting vaccinated, uh, you know, people who are 65 and above, it's not even 1% of the people who have been uh, fully vaccinated yet at this point. And of course, Tokyo Olympics is scheduled to happen uh, from July 23rd. Okay, moving on, I'd like to first touch upon four uh, historical sort of moments or uh, historical factors that seem to impact on Japan's COVID responses so far. And starting with the pre-war Japan, uh, Japan is known as a typical case of state-led mode of modernization uh, and the role played by the Ministry of Interior in particular in that context. Uh, there's even a slogan, Kansan Minpi, reveal the official demand despite the people, uh, which reflects the bureaucratic culture uh, in Japan, maybe even to date. The other thing that is a bit more of an elaboration of the Japan's uh, mode of modernization uh, by the state uh, under the state's leadership is that the state controls to mobilize the society. Uh, so uh, there is also this uh, known term, bokuminkan, uh, shepherds of the people, which come from Chinese classical writing. Uh, the idea that the bureaucrats, particularly the bureaucrats of the Ministry of Interior, are the shepherds of the people. Uh, in other words, people like sheep. And so the state control and mobilize society. Uh, which is also to say that the state is not necessarily a big state. The Japanese state machinery, the bureaucracy can be quite lean, but it has the normative power to mobilize and control society in a kind of Foucauldian way, if you like. The Ministry of Interior used to be a very powerful ministry in the pre-war period until it was abolished by the American occupation after 1945. Um, it uh, encompassed the Shrine Bureau, uh, so controlling state Shintoism, the normative power of the state Shintoism. It has, of course, local affairs uh, bureau, uh, which is now the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications. Uh, the police, uh, Koban, uh, civil engineering, uh, in other words, construction, and sanitation bureau, which is, of course, the relevant bureau for us. And it all even had strong influence over the Ministry of Education. In fact, the top leadership of the Ministry of Education came from the bureaucrats of the Ministry of Interior. So this is important because this is the way in which the Japanese modern state from Meiji onwards controls society. It's sometimes said that uh, in every village in Japan in the Meiji Taisho era, at least there were three uh, buildings uh, with proper roof, not thatch roof, but with proper kawara. And these were uh, the uh, koban, uh, the pol police uh, station, uh, the school um, where children got educated. And then there's also the yakuba, the uh, municipal office, uh, all of which were controlled at least you know, indirectly by the Ministry of uh, Interior. So these were the tentacles of the state uh, in modernizing and in changing society uh, for state purposes. Uh, of course, I have in mind uh, the um, classic work by uh, Sheldon Garin, uh, Molding the Japanese Minds, also similar to the French mode of uh, modernization uh, in a book called uh, Peasants into Frenchmen uh, by Jürgen uh, Weber, Weber uh, the uh, historian uh, in California who passed away, of course. Um, but there was, you know, the Ministry of Interior had the mission of turning peasants into proper Japanese nationals. In wartime, uh, this kind of mode of state control and social mobilization takes even more extreme forms. Uh, the sanitation and social bureaus of the Ministry of Interior are turned into the Ministry of Health and Welfare in 1938 upon pressure from the Ministry of War in the context of the total mobilization drive that followed the start of the Sino-Japanese War in 1937. 
So this, I think, matters, and this still has an impact on the way the Ministry of Health and Welfare operates vis-a-vis -vis society. It was really uh, a wartime creation uh, with the mind from the point of view of the Ministry of War uh, to, uh, to ensure that uh, Japan has robust soldiers and healthy mothers who give birth to these soldiers. And that was the prime motivation behind the making of the Ministry of Health and Welfare in 1938. Um, the, um, of course, the most uh, well-known uh, horrible uh, part of the uh, wartime record associated with both the Ministry of War and Ministry of Health and Welfare is the Unit 731 uh, that conducted live human experiments on uh, on the local Chinese and prisoners of war, uh, and really random people sometimes uh, in Manchuria and elsewhere. Um, there were epidemiologists and pharmacologists of renown who were involved in the process. Uh, and many of these top epidemiologists joined the, uh, what is now the uh, National Infectious Disease Institute uh, and the academia, top schools like Kyoto University and Tokyo University, uh, and they all went home free. Uh, none of them were arrested or prosecuted uh, because they traded uh, the data, the secret information that they got uh, through the experiment to the uh, American uh, forces. Um, and uh, they, they got off the hook. Um, and of course, you know, I'm not arguing that therefore they are still conducting the same thing, but it does matter that they never draw, drew a line. They never really faced their wartime deeds and uh, conducting their own investigation and so forth. In fact, in one of the main sites of the National Infectious Disease Institute today, uh, there's a location in Toyama district in Shinjuku ward. Um, uh, now it's more than several years ago. I guess he was in the 1990s, maybe. Um, there were bones, remains, uh, unidentified remains that were uh, found when a new building was built for the National Infectious Disease Institute. And they are suspected to be from the victims of the human uh, experiments of the Unit 731, uh, because that was the place where the um, uh, army had the uh, labs uh, during uh, wartime. Um, and these people also uh, went on to have equally collusive ties with the pharmaceutical industry in the post-war period. In fact, some of the main actors of Unit 731 themselves uh, created a company called Green Cross in the uh, post-war, uh, which was Japan's blood bank, uh, and uh, they came to fame or notoriety uh, in the 1990s uh, because of the HIV contaminated blood scandal. They continued the Green Cross, uh, which is now a de facto company, uh, was trading in uh, HIV contaminated blood products, even though they knew already the high risks involved. Uh, there's also been a number of anti-vaccine class action lawsuits in the post-war Japan, which led to uh, the uh, kind of suspicion among the Japanese public uh, about the intentions of the uh, Ministry of Health and Welfare and the, um, the pharmaceutical industry in promoting vaccination. So sometimes people refer to vaccine, vaccine hesitancy in Japan as a culture, and it is true uh, that that exists, uh, but um, that has to do with the uh, history uh, of the mistrust that is placed by the Japanese people sometimes on these uh, state actors. Well, that comes to a big change, and in some ways, uh, some of the traditions of the Japanese uh, modernization are reversed or significantly modified during the era of neoliberal change. From the late 1970s, of course, coinciding with the rise of people like Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan to power, in Japan too, this uh, neoliberal thinking that uh, starts to be explored from the Ohira period onwards. Uh, 
the Japanese started, ruling elites started to talk about Japanese style welfare society as opposed to, of course, Western style welfare state. In other words, this is a different way in which the state was trying to mobilize society for its own purposes. And housewives were described as head of, heads of family, katecho, it's a made up word. Uh, in one of the documents that were produced by the LDP as it was exploring neoliberal policy change. And it's a glorified way of talking about housewives uh, taking care of uh, the uh, family and providing care to children, but also to the elderly so that they don't become burden on the state. Uh, as Japan uh, entered the uh, aging um, society and tax reform uh, was also promoted, uh, neoliberal reforms, consumption tax introduction and welfare spending cuts uh, get tied together since the 1980s. And this is quite important and relevant. The Ministry of Finance gets the upper hand over the Ministry of Health and Welfare. If the Ministry of Health and Welfare has to justify welfare spending increase with the coming of aging society, well, it, it, they somehow have to cooperate with the MOF uh, in increasing consumption tax or has to sort of work within the boundaries, budgetary boundaries set uh, by the MOF. Uh, and the LDP government uh, started to emphasize self-help from that time onwards. Uh, Suga drew attention when he ran for the presidency of the LDP uh, last year when Abe resigned and his slogan was Jijo uh, Kyojo Kojo Soshite Kizuna, self-help, mutual help and public health, help and uh, Kizuna, which is like bond. Um, and uh, in other words, he prioritized self-help but this is an LDP consensus from at least the 1980s. Self-help comes first and don't become a burden on society or on the state. Uh, and this is a different sort of neoliberal transformation of the Naimusho, the Ministry of Interior kind of norm. It's a modified way in which the state continues to control and mobilize society, but in a kind of rather more neoliberal fashion. More than 40% of the Hokenjo, the health centers, have been cut since the mid-1990s to date. So if the PCR tests are very few in number and still few in number, at least a significant part of the reason comes from the fact that state capacity has been reduced so much over the past decades. Uh, infectious disease beds are also down to one-fifth of the level that Japan used to have in the late 1990s. Uh, today. Um, there's also been, of course, cuts in vaccine development research budget, which has not really been significantly increased in the way that it has been increased in the US or in European countries even today. Finally, uh, there is also a significant change politically and more broadly uh, in terms of the loss of political check and balance that uh, resulted from the collapse of the DPJ government uh, in December 2012, when the LDP uh, led by Abe came back to power. Uh, neoliberal transformation of governance that started from the late 1980s and in the 1990s and in the Koizumi years uh, was predicated on the idea that the consensus base of uh, consensus style of policy making is now modified into a more British style, uh, you know, winner takes all single party government format uh, based on manifesto commitments. But the final check in terms of democratic accountability was supposed to be safeguarded by the presence of an alternative, alternative uh, party in waiting uh, in the form of a two-party uh, system. But with the collapse of the DPJ and with the weakening and the division in the opposition camp, the neoliberal transformation of governance of the centralization of power goes out of control. There is no significant check left in the party system anymore, and which also resulted in the loss of broader uh, check and balance in the political system uh, overall. 
there's been excessive centralization of power in the Kante, in the prime minister's office. Uh, and that has been aggravated by the establishment of the Cabinet Personnel Bureau in 2014. And so what that means is that Ministry of Health and Welfare, the uh, Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications that, of course, oversees local government policy, these uh, ministries are no longer uh, equipped with the state capacity that it needs, and the top bureaucrats are always looking toward the Prime Minister's office for further promotion, uh, rather than looking at the reality of uh, the hospitals or of the local governments that are dealing with the pandemic. There's also been a significant loss of accountability in the diet. The opposition parties that are weak and divided and underrepresented by the first past the post system, uh, they are not able to hold the government accountable. Prime Minister from the time of Abe and Suga too get away with no answers. Even at this point, Suga continues to refuse to say uh, in what scenario the Olympics can be cancelled or should be cancelled, and he gets away with it, because also the muzzled and uncritical media. The Japanese media have never been as militant or as combative or as invest investigative as typical media in the West, but they have gotten uh, even more muzzled. Uh, after the LDP returned to power in December 2012. In the absence of an alternative in the opposition, the media feel that they cannot be uh, so combative, uh, that they feel that the LDP government is the only game in town. And so uh, you have very little critical reporting on the COVID responses in the media, major newspapers in Japan to date. Um, there's also been a loss of constitutional constraints and serious undermining of the rule of law that has been noted by several policies during Abe premiership already, and the con uh, situation remained the same with Suga government. So you have serious elite collusion uh, and uh, unaccountable uh, elites, uh, and they are currently single-mindedly pursuing the hosting of the Olympics in late July. Uh, which was postponed only by a year, by the way, uh, when the decision was made in March last year uh, by uh, Prime Minister Abe. Prime Minister Abe wanted to, uh, insisted, according to reports, on the postponement by a year rather than by two years, as uh, IOC's Bach or uh, Mori, uh, the, uh, at that time the head of the organizing committee of Japan, uh, suggested. Uh, because Abe wanted to, uh, you know, use the Olympics as his grand finale, uh, as his, uh, uh, his term as the president of the LDP was to be until September this year. Um, and he wanted to use the Olympics as a big opportunity. And, uh, of course, people uh, are now thinking that if the Olympics were postponed by two years rather than one, maybe it, it would have been a, a less of a problem uh, today. So what are the key features of Japan's COVID-19 responses? And I have three slides to finish uh, my presentation. Um, so there's been a severe decline in state capacity covered, by, covered up by a generally healthy, hygienic, orderly and compliant population. And this is maybe something that is not being understood by the IOC, for example, or by even many foreign observers. Uh, why, is ja the, why are the Japanese complaining about? And why do they think that Japan is not ready to host the Olympics? Well, it's because people have been uh, doing gamma, enduring, uh, they have been uh, restraining themselves. They are the ones who, are, who have been bearing the burden of the COVID responses, not so much the state. I think very few people in Japan, as the polls indicate, think that it's thanks to the Japanese government that Japan's record is better than many Western societies. The state has been giving highest priority on protecting itself, the state. Uh, and particularly its limited medical resources without significantly adding to them, which account for the limits in the number of PCR tests conducted because they don't want to find out, uh, you know, uh, the uh, asymptomatic cases or light patients. Uh, they have focused on cluster infections 
uh, early on, particularly in the COVID response. Uh, they have also preached the three Cs in that context as well. And self-restraint, Jishku, has been the biggest policy component, if you can call it a policy, which naturally means that there is a very heavy burden on women and the family, individuals. Um, there is a very significant gender bias in the Japanese uh, COVID response. And I am aware of the fact that the COVID is hitting the women in uh, the hardest in almost all societies. But in the Japanese case, I think even more, that is even more the case. Uh, the suicide, the lo loss of job, the depression, uh, all these things that are in, uh, impacting the Japanese population uh, are impacting women uh, you know, more uh, heavily uh, than men uh, very clearly. Japan, the Japanese people, of course, wear masks, uh, but they feel that they are like in an eternal limbo of the soft lockdown. Uh, with Corona uh, is actually a slogan sometimes used by the government, particularly by the local governments. So we are stuck in it for a long time. So maybe it's not the hell that European societies and the US experienced early at certain point, but Japan is still not out of the limbo. Um, the Japanese government have never really fully revised the policy of preaching people to stay home for the first four days, even if you have a slight fever. Don't bother us. Don't bother the uh, public health centers. Don't even call up. Stay home and see where you go for the first days. You feel like you have symptoms. Um, and uh, today, uh, even though uh, there is a much bigger number of uh, patients infected, uh, what's called jitaku ryoyo, which is a very hard word to translate in English, uh, because essentially it's just people told to rest at home. Uh, even though they are found to be positive, they are not getting the medical help that they sometimes need. And sometimes people die because uh, they are just abandoned at home while house resting. So uh, you see a uh, high degree of bureaucratic inertia, uh, particularly in the ministries, because even though the Minister of Health and Welfare is in charge of the health policy, well, the Prime Minister's office is taking the lead, supposedly. And so they are waiting and see, seeing what is, uh, what is the latest order that comes to them. But the political leadership has been very erratic in the absence of accountability. There's been tremendous centralization of power in the hands of the PM's office, as I mentioned, uh, particularly since Koizumi's uh, premiership. And so, so, for example, when Abe was prime minister, there was an abrupt and uncoordinated nationwide school closure, which seemed very er uh, erratic and also, quite frankly, unnecessary at the time uh, in March last year, which... Uh, also left a legacy that now the government is very much against closing schools, even when they, that seemed to be the wiser cause of action, including the universities, uh, um, you know, moving online. Um, one year postponement decision of the Olympics that I uh, touched upon already, which was really Abe's decision. Uh, no significant boost to the vaccine development budget even today. And of course, Japanese companies have yet to develop their own vaccines. Uh, and Japan is entirely reliant on uh, foreign production. Um, Abe no mask fiasco. Uh, many of you probably know that there was this notorious idea coming from a uh, closest bureaucratic associate of Abe's in the Kante uh, about distributing two uh, cloth masks uh, per household, um, very random and very, um, you know, inefficient uh, policy. Um, but, you know, uh, about one of the few things that the government has done to the people. There was also an ill-advised go-to travel campaign uh, that was conducted in uh, from summer and autumn last year, which is widely seen as having contributed to the rise of the third wave of the corona infection. Uh, this year, there was a premature lifting of the third SOE uh, in, um, uh, in March, which invited the fourth current 
uh, SOE uh, inevitably with another surge coming up. Uh, and la last December, the government, the central government uh, under SUGA made the decision to follow the usual local level vaccine administration procedure. In other words, the government uh, of SUGA and the SUGA decided that, okay, we're going to treat COVID vaccination just the way we treat uh, every year the flu vaccination programs. So each municipality is in charge of designing its own vaccination schedule and procedure. Some municipalities decided to rely on the uh, GPs, general practitioners, uh, and some municipalities are uh, have looked into opening up gymnasiums and whatnot for uh, more large, larger scale uh, vaccination procedure. But the national government decided to not to try to have a nationwide coordinated system and only now adding uh, larger uh, uh, vaccination sites or even uh, latest announcement by SUGA was to have companies and universities have their own sites on top of the municipal uh, vaccination programs. Uh, this is one last slide. Uh, and uh, there's been a general failure of accountability and communication from the central government and from the prime ministers. There's been a glaring failure to update and correct COVID measures. And this is to do with the earlier slides that I showed you about the uh, status traditions from Meiji time, uh, Meiji period onwards. So for example, the three Cs, the government initially argued that you need to avoid the three Cs coinciding together. In other words, as long as the Cs are just one C, so if it's a closed space, but if people do not have close contact, it's okay. Only now they are starting to say, but not publicly making it clear that even one C is problematic. But because they have always worked on this assumption of the uh, omnipotent and omniscient state that is never in the wrong, that they are, uh, unable to frankly acknowledge that we now have more scientific knowledge and better advice to give to the people. And the past advice uh, was perhaps wrong uh, from today's perspective. The same goes to mask wearing, uh, because Abeno mask was a cloth mask. Today, uh, experts think that there are better types of masks that are highly recommended but the government is reluctant to acknowledge that not all masks are the same. Um, digitalization has also been very much delayed uh, in the system. No political leader is clearly in charge because of the loss of accountability. Nobody wants to be held accountable. So sometimes it's a prime minister, but there's also a health minister. There is the COVID minister, Nishimura. There is the vaccine minister, Kono. Uh, and there's, of course, daily, uh, twice a day briefings that are provided by the chief cabinet secretary. And then on top of that, you have the governors, people like Yoshimura in Osaka, Koike in Tokyo, and everybody's trying to dodge their own responsibility. Um, and uh, there's uh, also an absence of politically independent panel of experts. The panel of experts led by Dr. Omi, Omi is becoming somewhat more vocal in uh, asserting itself, but still it's very much up to the government. And so the uh, Suga government flatly refuses to take formal advice from the panel of experts about the feasibility of the Olympics, um, even now. Uh, there's also been a failure of center local government coordination that is behind the chaos uh, that is the uh, vaccination program in Japan. Uh, the central government uh, is in control, supposedly. Japan has a very strong uh, unitary state and the local governments are used to taking orders and need the information and the expert advice from the central government because they are understaffed and uh, lacking in resources but the central government is putting the blame on the local government. We told you to do this, why are you not doing it? Um, so there's a real failure of center local government coordination. And of course, people end up paying the price for that. 
So there's a growing popular dissatisfaction with the government and its policies, despite Japan's perceived success. So I stop here and I'd like to move on to, uh, um, to uh, Inchu's comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Nakano, for this very uh, blunt and critical analysis of, uh, of the situation of COVID in Japan. Uh, you put a lot on the table. And so I'm now going to turn uh, to Yingxiu for some thoughts and comments. Well, thank you so much Eve, for your introduction. Uh, it's a uh, it's great pleasure and honor to serve as the discussant here to, for today's event. Um, first of all, I would like to thank CGR and particularly Saya for organizing the event. And of course, thank you Eve very much for inviting me to, to be the discussant here. And also, it's such a great pleasure to meet Nakano Sensei, uh, even uh, with uh, in this virtual um, settings. And also thank you so much for your wonderful presentation about the Japan's COVID response um, from the political and historical perspectives. Um, and I truly believe that this is a really timely and critically important topic because looking back, starting from the very end of 2019, every one of us, and I believe including every one of the audience um, on the other side of the screen has been staying at home or working from home for almost like one year and a half. And and this is really, truly unbelievable and difficult to cope with um, in the current context of globalization. And not to mention that we probably need another six months or even more to go back to the expected normalcy or a new normalcy. And also over the past year, and we have gradually understand the far reaching global effect that COVID-19 brought to every country and every society and also every one of us. And those challenges of course include arranging from like physical wellness problems in terms of how different national environment uh, governments across the world really should be get prepared in terms of their medical care system and in terms of their public health policies. And also to uh, the emotional wellness, uh, I think Professor Nakano has mentioned in, in your presentation about how COVID really impacted women and family, and most importantly, the education of the younger generation, right? And also we have these challenges about the economic wellness, this internal dilemma between economic efficiency and human security, especially in the context of globalization. And I believe that it is because of these unprecedented challenges that has generated a lot of uh, national experiment and policy responses across Across the world in the midst of uncertainties. And among them, we have to admit that Japan has been under the spotlight for research and comparative analysis for not only political leadership, but also for scholars like us in academia. And I think from like my personal perspective, the experience of Japan under COVID-19 over the past one year and a half uh, was full of really interesting puzzles and unexplained phenomenon, especially from the comparative setting. For example, um, on the one hand, I believe in the first several months after the reports of the first uh, confirmed case, I, I believe that was in Tokyo on the last day of January in 2020, Japan was highly praised by the world community about the efficacy and efficiency of uh, their um, so-called cluster buster approach to contain the spread of COVID, um, particularly in the Tokyo, uh, uh, Tokyo uh, cosmopolitan area. But on the other hand, um, there has been an increasing number of Japanese uh, public health scholars and including you, Professor Nakano, showing that the concern about the true infection rate probably may be much more serious and much more uncertain than estimated mostly due to the lowest PCR checking rate in Japan compared to other countries in the world. And also politically speaking, um, we can see on the one hand, there was been you know, the skyrocketing public support for political leadership, especially in the European Union, right? Um, typically example includes uh, Merkel, uh, German Chancellor Merkel, um, and also as well as a French President Macron. But on the other hand, we saw in 2020, uh, the I think the public approval rating for Abe administration dropped down below 40% and reached probably the historical uh, lowest point. And even recently, whereas there has been a really 
uh, rapid rollout plan of vaccination, especially in, in neoliberal countries in like, for example, in UK, United States, and even here in Canada a little bit. But on the other hand, we saw, you know, this lowest, probably the slowest rate of rollout vaccination in, in, in the country of Japan, um, despite the country was has been known for uh, its really strong role of state and uh, strong coordination, even with the lean bureaucracy, as you mentioned in your presentation. So there has been a lot of uh, interesting puzzles and unexplained phenomenon. And I, I believe that your presentation today has really offered a very, very important historical and institutional perspective, which really helped me and also I believe helped many audiences in today's event to understand um, what is going on in Japan under COVID. And what really uh, it seems really surprising and shocking to me is that you kind of in your presentation revealed this, um, the other side of a story about the role of state in Japan, which turned out less uh, capable, uh, more uh, vulnerable and less resilient in, in, in front of a COVID and pandemic. And it really showed us the problems left by this deep rooted historical and institutional legacies that's really emphasizing the revering officialdom and of course protecting the state, especially even with the beginning of the neoliberal reforms. So since Professor Nakano has showed us the importance of uh, the historical institutions, so I would like to uh, start my first question, of course, from the political perspective, because from the retrospective perspective, we have to admit that the year of 2020 was deemed an unusual year in the history of Japanese politics, especially for the history of LDP governance, right? And then a lot of important events took place and or either took place or was scheduled to happen. Uh, most importantly, uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe stepped down after eight years of serving as the prime minister in Japan. And then it was followed by another general election in the Japanese diet. And also uh, in terms of international relations and foreign policy, uh, the Chinese President Xi Jinping was scheduled to make a state visit in Japan in April 2020, but then it was canceled and never resumed to talk anymore. And of course, we have this highly controversial Olympic Games, um, uh, Japan's decision to hold and of course postpone, but still hold the 2020 Tokyo Olympic Games. So uh, in terms of, because in terms of this really changing political environment. So my um, first question is about, in addition to this long lasting historical institutions, how do you think that this changing political environment really impacted uh, the Japanese government or Abe administration, now the Suga administration, come up with their policy response to COVID? And in particular, how this change in political environment has really changed the political situation that LTP has to face in, in, in a Japanese society and has created new challenges for the new prime minister, Suga. So that is my first question. And also my second question is about the economics. Um, because trained as the political economist, as you know, um, my first understanding of post-war Japan was really from uh, the Japanese economic miracle. And of course, from Thomas Johnson's book on the importance of the role of state and ja Japanese bureaucracy on Japanese economic development after the Second World War. And um, I believe not only you, but also one, every one of us from a daily newspaper and media coverage, we saw that there's a lot of dilemma between economic efficiency and human security. We saw a lot of uh, difficulties faced by small businesses, a lot of difficulties faced by Japanese firms who has to transform their human resource management from working on sites to working from home, in addition to the short of supply of ICT products for every Japanese household. So um, I would like to, you know, uh, to understand what is the role of economics played in, in you know, Abe's uh, policies in terms of to the response to COVID crisis, and particularly what is the specific role of uh, like METI or Ministry of Finance and many other important agencies, economic agencies, 
how has they played a role in terms of the ABIS plan or LDP's plan in terms of dealing with this crisis? And of course, I have so many, so many questions, but I think due to the limited time, I would like to have my last question about the future of Japanese uh, politics and economy, because we have to really move forward. And I'm asking these questions because I think in 2015, um, the Japanese cabinets, uh, Abe cabinet, as well as the House of Representatives, the Diet, um, formed uh, a committee uh, called the Choose for uh, the Future 2.0 about the, J the Japanese future, future of political economy and society. I think in that report, I think our Prime Minister Abe really targeted 2020 as the jumpstart for the rebuilding a Japanese economy. And specifically, he aims to target um, the birth rate, low productivity, as well as the concentration of population, particularly in the Tokyo cosmopolitan area. And we know that, um, of course, according to the recent uh, published uh, think tank report in Japan, um, most of these goals has not been uh, achieved as expected. I think COVID has played an important role on that. So if I maybe vote here, so I'm, I'm really interested in, in your opinion. So what do you think is most likely to be changed, you know, after the end of the COVID-19 and what is most likely to be sustained in terms of Japanese institutions, politics, and of course, in society. So with that, I, I will stop here. I'm really looking forward to a response, but thank you so much for your wonderful presentation today. Uh, thank you very much, Incho, for raising all those uh, great uh, comments and questions. Uh, so, Koichi, uh, you, you have the choice to respond first. Uh, you know, there's a question on um, the, this unusual set of events, how uncertainty shaped the LDP's response, the impact of economic thinking, uh, especially by economic ministry, uh, on the response, and then finally, the long-term impact of COVID uh, for Japan. Uh, so if you wish to address those, uh, you may, otherwise uh, we'll yeah. get to Q. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, I tried to, you know, respond at this briefly uh, to Inchu's uh, excellent questions. And uh, maybe starting, you know, with the last one, you know, uh, what about the political future or economic future of Japan? And I think it's, quite frankly, I think it's very hard to be optimistic. Uh, I think, you know, this could be remembered as when Japan started to really fall. Uh, you know, in retrospect, I think uh, the uh, existing problems that Japan faced and the kind of responses that the government had in mind, you know, were severely derailed and aggravated. And I think at this point, it's hard to think of a way out of this in a way that is going to lead to Japan regaining its competitiveness. Uh, and... Um, um, so, you know, and the, the reasons for that is really to do with the fact that, you know, so going um, now moving on to your second question about the economy, maybe, um, I think, you know, the, uh, the Japanese uh, political economy, well, the economic policy of the recent years since Abe, you know, so earlier on there was Abenomics and all that sort of thing. But then at the end of the day, people were waiting. So what is going to happen in terms of growth strategy, in terms of, you know, structural reform? And at the end of the day, I think the only thing that they really had in mind was things like casinos. In other words, inbound tourism, the promotion of inbound tourism was really the big thing that the Japanese government was, you know, betting upon. And the Olympics was supposed to be the cherry on top of the cake, right? And so uh, it was about really encouraging, uh, you know, the hospitality business to use this opportunity to showcase Japan to the world. And so the, the decision to postpone the Olympics was really very difficult because of that. And now the question is, of course, in the era of pandemic, and having had such a serious blow on the uh, hospitality business and on this idea of using inbound tourism to governize Japan's economy, what else can the government come up with now uh, in terms of turning things around? Uh, and I think that's really a question that nobody has an answer to. Uh, and in terms of the uh, the first question about the you know political the political impact of COVID uh, and the uncertainty that it created, I think because of this uh, focus on the Olympics and on casinos and on really increasing inbound tourism and um, 
uh, you know, boosting national pride and everything. Um, I think the initial reaction to the uncertainty created, which is still, I think, sticking with us, is denial. I think the government officials, the political leaders, the first course of action is really to deny that this is a serious matter. And so they kept on sort of delaying serious, you know, important hard decisions. And that, I think, accounted for the uh, lack of earlier responses in a way that was more serious. And once it was kind of, uh, you know, revealed that their responses were too late and not sufficiently aggressive, then, of course, they have to justify that they did nothing wrong. And so they kept on sort of adding to that denial and to escapism. And I think uh, this is uh, a real issue. And it's to do with the, uh, you know, the loss of uh, Plan B. The, you know, because I think the loss of accountability, the loss of competition in the party system is really to do with this fact that we, are, we only have Plan A. Um, and so Olympics must be done uh, at, you know, at whatever cost because they don't really have any plan B. And I think, you know, this is the kind of issue that is, uh, you know, stuck with Japan. And, uh, you know, looking into the future, of course, the, the really hard question is, so, okay, so you say there is only plan A, but if plan A fails, what? And I don't think anybody really has come around to, you know, suggesting a plan B. And uh, this is, uh, you know, how serious I think this is, this is. And of course, you know, COVID may have a strong impact, you know, and maybe, you know, if we meet again, I don't know, like if we have this session, like, I don't know, 10, 20 years down the road, and then, you know, if we look back and what happened, you know, so what happened to China? You know, what happened to the United States? What happened to the European countries? It would be very interesting to see, but I think, uh, you know, we can already start to imagine what is the you know, uh, the uh, impact of COVID uh, on the longer term change? And um, well, unless you know the Japanese public have a serious rethinking and start to invest on a plan B uh, and prepare an alternative to the LDP government, uh, it's very hard to think how we can get out of this in a way that is uh, beneficial to the Japanese and to the world. Thank you. Great. Um, I actually have my own three questions, but I'll jump first to a question from Glenn, which is relevant to what you just said. Um, and so Glenn is asking, given the inadequate response to COVID-19 by Prime Minister Suga, the LDP and the bureaucracy, given the legacy of scandals, Moritomo, Kakes, Sakura no Kai, etc., given the low support for Japan holding the Olympics, 60 to 80 percent of the public seems to be against, given the slow rate of vaccination, and given the low support, about 40% or lower for the cabinet, why is it that the opposition parties have been so unsuccessful in gaining the support of the Japanese voters? And what will it take for them to vote out the LDP and vote in an alternative political leadership? Yeah, no, uh, thank you, Glenn, for, uh, for a good question. This is a question I wake up with every day. Uh, um, as uh, some of you know, I've been uh, working with the opposition parties uh, to try to sort of, you know, uh, come up with a plan B, an alternative, and trying to convince the Japanese public that we need one and we can have one. Um, and it's really a, a difficult question that I have yet to uh, come up with a successful answer. Uh, and, um, uh, but, you know, uh, well, let me try why, you know, that hasn't happened yet. Um, I think uh, first, you know, because I think, you know, we could have had the same kind of question with, uh, with the United States, right? Um, um, of course, you know, Biden won by a narrow margin and God knows what's going to happen in 2024. Uh, and um, the, the, the question is, you know, why was the US able to at least, you know, deliver Biden's victory? Uh, and, uh, but, you know, of course, also the other question is why on earth there are still so many people in the US think that Trump is the answer to all questions that America has. Um, and I think, you know, the difference is actually significant, but also uh, fairly slim in the end. In the Japanese case, I think, you know, the bastions of liberal thinking, of uh, nurturing a liberal alternative, uh, has always been weaker than in a country like the United States, and it's been weakened further 
in the years uh, since Abe returned to power. So I think I'm thinking of places like universities, uh, the media, you know, the local governments. These were the places where you could start to build an alternative to the status quo uh, and uh, to show that the LDP is not the only you know, game in town. But they have been weakened and they have been, uh, in some cases, conquered or really sort of muzzled, emasculated over the years. And so, uh, you know, you really have very much uh, fewer resources to uh, build uh, an alternative to begin with. And the Japanese people, of course, are used to this idea of the LDP as the only, you know, game in town. And uh, so the, you know, to try to convince the public that, well, actually this doesn't have to be this way uh, is, uh, is much harder than it is in many other societies. And even, you know, other societies in the, in, uh, in the Asian region, like Korea and Taiwan, Japan, I think, really stands out in this collective sort of a belief that uh, there could be no alternative. And uh, uh, this is a, a real sort of structural problem that Japan suffers from on a societal level, not just as, you know, as a political phenomenon. Um, another point I think that is somewhat related to the first point uh, is the fact that you need to build a coalition between the liberal forces and the more left-wing forces in Japan but that is also proving to be very, very difficult to do. And of course, you know, this is the kind of question that uh, all progressive you know, forces in other societies too have to face. Uh, you know, the more liberal moderate you know, camp uh, uh, you know, opinion. And on the other hand, the more strongly anti-globalization, anti-big uh, business voices uh, that have become stronger from around 2010 uh, worldwide you know, Occupy movement and, you know, whatnot, and how to, you know, how are we going to build that? Well, in Japan, precisely because of the lack of alternation in power and the normalcy that is the conservative dominance, uh, the liberals have always been quite weak in Japan and sometimes even weaker than the left because the left can at least be purist. Uh, they can be principled. Uh, and if you are not going to win power, it's better to be principled by, than compromised. Uh, and that kind of dynamics continue to be quite strong in Japan. And so even though in the recent years, since 2015 and 2016 in particular, there's been efforts to between the uh, opposition parties to collaborate together, the, it's relatively easy for the conservatives to try to drive a wedge uh, between the liberals or the moderates on the one hand and the more left-leaning forces on the other hand. And whether the opposition forces can overcome that division is still a very much an ongoing process that I personally also spend a lot of time dealing with. Uh, but um, I think without the overcoming uh, of the division between the moderates and the left uh, Japan's alternative will not be built. And that's the only uh, way in which we can try to have a plan B, I think. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'll, I'll now put uh, a couple of uh, small questions to you. Uh, one is actually trying to take uh, a bit of the, uh, of the other view, that is one data point that, that doesn't lie is deaths per million, right? And uh, today, Japan is at 103. Uh, most European countries in the US are between 1,700 and 2,100. UK is 1,800 plus, right? So we have, we're talking of a 1 to 20 ratio, right? So something is not that bad in Japan, right? <laughs> in the end, right? Uh, and one clue that has been given by Margarita Estevez Abe, and I'm curious to hear your reaction, uh, is that you know, in a place like Canada or the US, Initially, 80% of the deaths happened in elderly care homes. And mm. that doesn't seem to have been the case in Japan. Uh, and so Margarita Estevez Abe's response in her recent research was that there was a very effective uh, non-politicized response, which happened from the unit in the Ministry of Health and Welfare, where they had a procedure that was ready before, where they would just shut down, uh, you know, they would shut down access to those homes and, and so that there is no transfer from outside. Also, unlike say the US and Canada, 
there is no issue of privatization of those homes where and and staff will have to do three jobs and therefore travel a lot and carry the disease into those elderly care homes. So is there is there a story here? Is there something else on the on the positive side, right? To get to a ratio of one to twenty. Mm -hmm. um, my second question is, you know, um, when we study the Asian cases. Basically, what we find out is that it's a story basically of developmental state, right? Mm -hmm. It's a story of institutional strengths, but the institutions that are in that are relevant uh, in a way one level below the, the structure, it is, for example, the availability of pandemic headquarters. Mm -hmm. So Korea, Singapore, Taiwan, Mongolia of all places, uh, etc., had a pandemic headquarter in place between January 19, Mongolia is the first, January 19, and January 30 for all of those. Uh, and those headquarters have all powers. They coordinate all the ministries, they centralize the response, and they were set up by law in advance, right, in response to SARS. Japan has no such thing. And from what I gathered, only March 23 after the law is passed, they have to pass a law first. Uh, there is a loose version of that. Um, and the irony, however, is some of the best practices in Vietnam or in Mongolia came from ADB, came from WHO, where the head of WHO Asia unit is a Japanese. So there was actually a filtering of Japanese good practices to other places, but somehow not followed in Japan in terms of having a rapid reaction, right? Having a rapid headquarter, pandemic headquarter, uh, having rapid testing having uh, the rapid production of PP, all the things that all these other countries did uh, and Japan didn't do. Uh, so I wonder what this puzzle, right? And why in particular there was no learning from SARS? Because for all of the others, it's SARS and MERS that led them to pass all those laws. You know, Taiwan had laws on the book that, that created the CDC and it was activated as early as January 15 and for Taiwan, right? So why, and those things came from a lot of Japanese learning from the past, right? And it seems that there was a learning loss in Japan. Uh, is, is there a story here or is it essentially the story of the post 1990s neoliberal reforms? Um, and then finally on vaccination, uh, when I was reading uh, Nikkei reports and all this in mid 2020, uh, you know, they initially would list all the firms that were in the race for vaccine and included some Japanese firms but somehow they didn't make it. Uh, so, you know, Japan is a strong biotech industry. Uh, why, could, uh, why could the US do it? Why could Europe do it? Why could uh, Russia, why could China do it? And why Japan is so advanced and you know, as a leader in many fields, including biotech, why didn't it work, right? What, what's there? Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's coming in the future, but just too late. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you. Um, in terms of the uh, first set of questions that you raised, I think, you know, in a way you can, you, you can sort of, you know, uh, credit the sort of almost like autopilot of society, you know, in the, as a, as a kind of a legacy of state control uh, and social mobilization. I think you do have sort of, you know, uh, smaller level institutions and relationships that, make Jap the Japanese society, and not necessarily the Japanese state, but the Japanese society better resistant or good at, you know, uh, uh, hygienic responses. Uh, and I think, you know, it has to do with this orderly, well-controlled, you know, uh, polite uh, society. And I think, you know, uh, the, there are institutional roots that I kind of touched upon, uh, in spite of the change in the state uh, during the neoliberal years, I think there are these practices and, uh, you know, lower level institutions that, uh, you know, that, uh, that helped uh, Japan respond well uh, in general. And as you noted, uh, the elderly homes in particular uh, uh, that can be, I think, mentioned. But when it comes to the pandemic headquarters, I think what you see is that the, at the kind of higher level of the state, then you really do have a much more neoliberal, uh, I, I think, unaccountable uh, problem with the elites. The political leaders, uh, Abe, for example, you know, he was not only late in setting up the pandemic headquarters, 
even after it was set up or even when he was, you know, sort of um, uh, informally there, he paid little attention to that. You know, in uh, January, in February, he was getting criticized for, you know, attending the coronavirus headquarters meeting just for, you know, like three minutes, giving the opening speech and then skipping it uh, to attend, you know, uh, dinners with his ideological friends. And um, this was, you know, uh, around the time of the uh, Diamond Princess, uh, you know, PR disaster uh, that uh, took place. But I think you do have the lack of political will uh, on the part of the uh, Japanese elites. And in fact, it's actually fairly consistent when you look at the uh, Abe government period as well. There were natural disasters like heavy rains or typhoon or earthquake and in every single one of them, Abe ended up getting criticized for lack of interest. And I think, you know, you end up having a failed political system, a party system uh, that is unable to hold the rulers accountable. And you have these hereditary politicians uh, who are entitled to be in power because of their birth. Uh, they don't seem to pay that much attention to the plight of the people. And I think that accounts for the, you know, in spite of the legacies of the developmental state and the, you know, state machinery and the well-controlled society, you don't have the political will anymore. And so innovative, uh, you know, approach to institutions and new practices are sorely missing in the picture. You know, some of the uh, better practices may flow or naturally from what is left uh, remaining, uh, even if they're under-resourced. Uh, but when you need more resources, when you need more uh, innovative machineries, they are not forthcoming. And maybe that is also to do with the fact that SARS didn't leave the trauma that he left in many other Asian societies in the Japanese case. Uh, it's more of a foreign scare than something that was uh, left a mark on the Japanese you know, uh, collective memory or uh, certainly not on the state machinery, I think. And uh, that may also be uh, to do with the failure of the vaccine development in Japan. In spite of the high level of scientific expertise, the uh, underfunding of the uh, you know, uh, vaccination development program, I think in Japan is quite, quite significant. And I think the pharmaceutical companies also have uh, stopped in investing over the past decade or more uh, because of the vaccine hesitancy in Japan and because, you know, developing vaccine doesn't really bring in so much money. And so in spite of the fact that the academic, you know, researchers were still, uh, uh, you know, maintaining a quite a high level, uh, I think, you know, the financial help that was necessary, the boost that was necessary was not forthcoming, either from the state or from these uh, big pharmaceutical companies in the Japanese case. Fascinating. Yeah, fascinating. So now I'm reading to uh, the audience question. Uh, so question from Andrew. Uh, it's about uh, female suicide. So Andrew argues we're seeing 15% more cases of female suicide in 2020 against a decade long declining trend. This is largely because of unemployed women having no hope of life. The solution, however, is more suicide help hotlines instead of targeted assistance. The last webinar that we had with Bill Emmett two weeks ago, uh, you know, argued that treating women equally is critical to the future of Japan's economy. Uh, that's based on Bill Emmett's uh, last book. Uh, what, in your opinion, is the reason for such a degree of neglect from all levels of government? Mm. Yeah, no, thank you for a great uh, and very important you know, uh, question. Um, I think, you know, uh, first, I think there is really embedded misogyny in the Japanese state and among the political elites that are historical and really uh, very little changed. And so even today, of course, Japan, you know, suffers greatly from the, um, you know, lack of women representation in the arenas of decision making. And so their plight are sometimes reported or talked about, but not really addressed. And this is to do with the, you know, deep seated indifference that the ruling elites of Japan continue to have to the, uh, you know, realities that is faced by women. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's not 
you know, it, it's, um, I mean, as I mentioned, I think you see similar kind of, um, you know, problems with disaster relief, disaster, post-disaster reconstruction, for example, with the East Japan earthquake, tsunami. Uh, and uh, in the government panels that deal with them, there was no woman. Uh, it didn't occur to them to include even a single woman when you're talking about uh, disaster relief even though the experience of women in shelters in the you know, uh, makeshift housing uh, units are different from men, uh, quite obviously. But they, they just don't see the problem and they don't really you know, uh, think that that is significant. And I think there is also this normative you know, uh, tradition, as I mentioned, you know, women are not supposed to be a burden on the state. They're supposed to alleviate the burden on the state you know, when the state uh, wants to do it on the cheap, it primarily falls on the woman to take care. I mean, as caregivers, as care providers, you know, men, you know, fight in the corporations. They commit to the uh, the uh, to the uh, companies even now because the you know uh, uh, absence of the boost in telework or in um, you know in digitalization even today, women are the ones who have to take a leave who have to provide care for the elderly who cannot even go to the hospital anymore or children who are now, you know, only going to school several days a week or, you know, um, when there is a closure because of uh, infection at school. So I think, you know, there are these reasons. And of course, women are also the ones who have the more precarious jobs, disproportionately lower paid and with no job security sometimes. And they are the ones who are exposed. But, you know, there is no thinking uh, in that respect uh, that is, uh, you know, coming in. And so I think that is really uh, a serious problem that is associated with uh, Japan only having, having a plan A. It's just not part of plan A. Sobering thoughts. Uh, thank you for those. Uh, there's a quick question here, informative by someone who needs some quick information. In case you know anything, uh, do you think the government of Japan will reopen the borders to international students? Uh, it was supposed the closure to international students was supposed to end with the second state of emergency, but has been kept until further notice. <laughs> what do you hear in this? domain mm -hmm. no it's a, it's a you know very significant issue for for you know for somebody like me who teach at the university too and uh, it's it's great to see albert's uh, name uh, again a, a former student uh, of ours and um, um, well i mean uh, there was a brief period of time when new students could come in but now of course it's been suspended again and in spite of the fact that the olympic athletes and the you know ioc members the sponsors and the you know the uh, press uh, now given priority to enter sometimes even without quarantine when it comes to the students, when it comes to the family members of the expat community in Japan, there is still, you know, a real blockade. Uh, and uh, it's hard to know when things will start to turn for the better, because Olympics are really the exception. The rule is that Japan is increasingly adding to the list of, you know, uh, entry ban or, you know, more, somewhat more stringent uh, quarantine measures. Uh, upon entry. And so, um, you know, because there's very few things that uh, the Japanese government is doing in terms of providing support for the population uh, in as they fight against COVID. The one thing that can be done on the cheap for the Japanese government is stricter border control. And even then they're willing to, you know, they're not so willing to invest that much. And so, you know, they, they usually only let people in upon the showing of a PCR test. It's all put on the burden on the people who are coming in. And the state spends little in terms of securing uh, the quarantine necessary, for example. Uh, and that is unlikely to change anytime soon. So uh, we are hoping that, you know, things start to turn for the better from the autumn semester. Uh, this year, but there is no real reason to uh, to sustain that hope. Actually, mm. well, I mean, to be uh, 
fair, it's a problem all over the world. And uh, sure. you know, to this day, for example, can look at border is closed, right? If we are closed then. Uh, and so far, we're not getting any signs uh, for the yeah. summer. No, no, I mean, the Japanese case, you know, it, it is the irony that the Olympics are getting complete exemption from that. But uh, it's true that, you know, it's true of uh, other countries as well. Right. Uh, then we have a question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, as you stated before, the Japanese government's initial refusal to acknowledge COVID as a serious threat has led to the, curious, the current situation being as poor as it is. But why is it that even now, the government still is not taking full responsibility for the problems it faces? Is it because of pride or something else? Yeah, no, I think it's because, you know, you do the political calculation. I think they're betting on being able to get out, getting away with it. So for example, uh, Abe, you know, when he was in office, uh, I think he was around 24th of June last year. He closed the ordinary session of the diet and he had a press conference and then he disappeared from the public view until he announced his resignation and Suga came to power in September. You know, so for like two, three months, Abe was completely missing in action. He didn't appear to answer questions from even the press let alone from the opposition politicians in the diet because the diet was closed. And Suga is following in the footsteps, you know, because he's not gonna answer any questions that the press has, he's rather, you know, he, he'd rather want to avoid having to answer them at all. Uh, and, um, you know, the media, I guess, is now trying to hold them accountable the best they can but they are not getting, you know, any better at it either. And so, uh, you know, at this moment, the uh, government is planning on um, closing the diet session on the 14th of June, even before the SOE that is currently in place gets lifted. Uh, and then they won't have to face questions from other politicians, other political parties, uh, as long as the diet is closed. And when it comes to the press, they can try to push the prime minister to have uh, a press conference, but they have a hard time. And when they do, the time is very limited. Uh, you know, incredibly uh, to the outside observers, I think, the press corps is not allowed to ask follow-up questions. This is standard practice for years in Japanese prime minister's press conferences. You get to ask one question, you are not supposed to follow up with another when the prime minister fails to answer your first question. You know, the, uh, the person who MCs the press conferences uh, is actually a bureaucrat uh, who is appointed by the uh, prime minister and her job is to protect the prime minister. Uh, and, um, you know, so, and you also have friendly media like Yomiuri and Sanke who are not planning on giving the prime minister a hard time. And so they think that if they can disappear and if they can sort of, you know, not get associated with the plight of the people, then, you know, well, you, you are not going to get blamed for that. Or uh, you can, start, you know, try to sort of, you know, dodge the blame and blame the local governments for being inefficient. The prime minister is working very hard. He's doing everything he can, but, you know, well, it's not happening because of other people. Uh, the opposition parties are wasting the time by grilling them with the scandals, the questions about the scandals. And so the opposition parties are acting, uh, you know, obstructionist. Uh, and they think that, you know, this is the best strategy. Mm -hmm. um, great. Uh, so I realized we have six minutes, so I'll put to you two more questions and then finally Saya will ask the last question. For now I'll bundle two questions and give you a two, two minute or so and then turn to Saya. Right. Uh, so there was Andrew's rejoinder. So it's, here we do allow for second question. So <laughs> uh, okay. uh, you know, following his earlier question, is it that the opposition parties are being weakened or that the opposition parties are too busy fighting among themselves? Governor Koike seems to have butchered the last visible attempt of an opposition alliance. Turns out yet another opposition reunion of the uh, Lincoln Minshuto in 2020 
is barely doing anything in the diet. Do you see future in the old BPJ camp, now the Limin, or should, will there be any new force, new social movement to champion the liberal progressive cause? So that's one question, I'll put that. Actually, I'll bundle you three. You can address whatever you like, because right? since time is short, there is a quick question on uh, related to Taiwan. What do you think, uh, why do you think Japan sending more AstraZeneca to Taiwan? Is there an application to show that Japan's continuation, uh, continual support to Taiwan after the Biden Suga summit? Um, and then uh, the other one from Sarah, in regards to digitalization and telework becoming a little more common in the COVID period, uh, while still severely lacking, do you think that the movement away from Tokyo and into surrounding periphery will be sustained? Ying Shu discussed this briefly, but it was, I was just curious about your thoughts regarding the subject. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. So, um, lots of content for a few couple right, of minutes. Right, right, right. I tried to be brief and address all the questions. With the uh, question about CDP, uh, the main opposition party today, I don't think it's true to say that they're not doing anything. I mean, I am frustrated with Edano's lack of aggressive leadership. Uh, there is something that is fundamentally problematic about his, you know, reserved character, I think. But... Actually, you know, the CDP has been working with the other opposition parties. They have also been submitting bills. They just don't get the attention. They don't get reported. The media do not report the opposition party. It's very different from a country like Canada or Britain or the United States, where it's customary for the news media to also report on what the opposition is doing, what the minority party is doing. At least you get some attention in Japan, get close to zero. And so they are trying to use Twitter, they are trying to use blogs, they are trying to have their own channel of communication. But, you know, Japan is still a country that is dominated by the mass media, uh, you know, for a large part. So uh, it's actually, you know, I'm, I'm quite sympathetic to the opposition parties in that sense. I mean, I do think that they can do more and they should do more, but I think it's really a very uneven playing field that you're talking about, which I don't know, you know, in, in my knowledge, I know of no other country that are called democracies with such an uneven uh, playing field tilted so much against the opposition parties. They just don't get on the radar. Uh, and even though they are, in spite of their you know, uh, minority status in the diet, they are doing their best in grilling the government, but also in submitting bills, uh, but they don't get the attention that they deserve. On the issue of Taiwan, um, I think you know, the uh, AstraZeneca uh, move is a combination of two things. One, of course, is to you know, uh, comply with the latest uh, change of you know, policy on the American side. And the other one is to do with vaccine hesitancy in Japan, which is not a serious problem yet at this point, because actually there is a greater number of people than expected who want to be vaccinated, but their turn is not. Uh, here yet. Uh, but I think AstraZeneca have ended up getting, you know, sort of bad publicity with the black cloth and, and so forth. And I think the government is worried that they cannot really use the stock that they have in a way that they were planning to maybe or thinking to uh, plan. And so uh, this is probably, you know, a good way to get rid of the stock that they have maybe. Uh, so I don't think it's all to do with goodwill or, you know, uh, a desire to comply with the American policy term. On the issue of the last uh, question about uh, whether people are moving out of Tokyo, it's hard to tell. I think uh, at this point, it's still anecdotal and whether it's going to be a long-term trend, uh, can you know we still have to wait and see because uh, there's been a rather more sustained, longer trend to over-concentrate everything to Tokyo. And even with the elderly population, you know, living in a you know, uh, in what we call mansion, right? The um, uh, high rise buildings uh, in central Tokyo without owning your own proper house uh, is a reasonably popular option because you don't need to bother about maintaining your own house. Uh, so uh, whether there's going to be a greater shift to the uh, suburb or even to the countryside, I, I'm not really sure because uh, in spite of the, you know, remote, uh, access and online, you know, uh, telework and stuff, 
the Japanese corporate culture is still very much face to face. Uh, you really do see people, you know, preferring uh, to meet physically to do business uh, in a way that is uh, kind of surprising sometimes. Uh, it's a generational thing for a part, but again, Japan is an aging society where middle age and older men are in charge. They are not really ceding command to any other people. Thank you. All right, so now I'm turning the microphone to Saya-san, who has a direct question for you. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, sorry, I asked that in the Q&A, but just quickly, um, there are a few moments, perhaps in Twitter and some media, where people were blaming on foreigners uh, on the spread of COVID virus as well. Um, I think Aso Taro last year said something, made a comment, like quite a ethnocentric comment about high Mindo, mm. which is sort of like, um, I don't know, people's certification or something like that. I don't know how to translate it. And But in parallel to that, uh, there are quite a lot of reporting regarding the death of Sri Lankan women in the detention center. And as well, I think there's quite a lot of reporting about um, migrant workers from Southeastern Asia being treated quite harshly, especially since the COVID. Um, and with the Olympics happening as well, uh, I was just wondering what you think of sort of this pandemic as um, what you think of any influence this pandemic would have in terms of Japanese uh, peoples or institutional xenophobic or ethnocentric characteristics that still exist in Japan. Um, if you had any yeah, no, thank you very much. Um, I think there's been a trend towards the escalation uh, of identity politics in Japan as well over the past years. And the pandemic had a way of accelerating that tendency. So on the one hand, you do have bigoted conservatives who really sort of exploit the situation. And we do have our own share of you know, crazy right-wingers who are actually quite close to the government people uh, you know, who still talk about you know Wuhan flu and Wuhan you know uh, pneumonia and stuff like that and uh, um, you know you do have people like Assel who's you know been uh, the longest serving deputy prime minister in spite of the many comments he's, he's, he has made so far um, to date uh, and uh, so you do have you know kind of polarized uh, right-wing uh, response and maybe heightened xenophobia in that respect. But on the other hand, I, I'm also really struck by the fact that you, you hear more progressive, more inclusive voices, particularly among the young people. Uh, so the public reaction against the you know, uh, revision of the um, immigration law and uh, the uh, you know, Sri Lankan woman who, has, uh, who died uh, when she was, you know, uh, you know, well, essentially incarcerated in spite of her, of her condition, and she fled from domestic violence. And instead of the police providing protection, she was arrested essentially for uh, overstaying and put in, a, you know, in the uh, facilities where she was, you know, uh, asking for medical uh, support but didn't get, and she just died. Right, and so uh, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, sort of, uh, of course, very shocked and uh, uh, horrified by what happened, but also uh, encouraged by the responses among the young people in particular, college students, my own students as well. But uh, you know, far beyond that, I think you also see that in on Twitter as well. Uh, in a way that we haven't seen before, uh, there is a social reaction against bigotry. Uh, and the issues are also LGBT issues, uh, you know, discrimination and violence against women as well. So you really do see a generational divide and also, you know, the polarization, uh, identity politics turning into a culture war uh, in Japan as well. But it's not as if the right wing is winning necessarily. Uh, I think there is a real, uh, you know, a respectable uh fighting back uh, from the more progressive voices. Uh, and uh, I think the future uh, may be in that direction, I hope. Fascinating. Very, very interesting. So uh, maybe I'll uh, give a chance to Ying Chiu if you have any uh, final comments, reactions. Um, please don't well, hesitate. Well, 
Thank you, Eve, for summoning summon me back. Um, <laughs> Um, it's a, this event is really a learning up a moment for me. I've learned a lot of uh, wonderful feedback and also I've learned a lot of interesting points raised by the audience as well. And the side story from my side is that I'm also equally concerned about the reopening of the Japanese border because recently I heard there was a petition by the Japanese scholars to the, uh, to the, to the Japanese government saying about the concern of the closing the border and about you know the effect on academic and intellectual exchange. So I really hope that um, uh, the border will be reopened soon. So hopefully we can meet each other um, in person some, sometimes in, in Japan. So thank you. you know, so I did sign that petition. <laughs> oh, really? That's great to know. <laughs> yeah, yes. of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I do hope that you can come. Thank you so much. And uh, Koichi-san, if you have any final uh, concluding words? Uh... No, no, no. Um, well, I, I'm just uh, wanting to thank all of you for your great uh, you know, questions and uh, comments, and uh, uh, Inchu in particular, but also Eve and Saya for a wonderful opportunity. And uh, well, I mean, this is you know the great thing about online, right? I mean, we can't meet physically, but at least there's something very good that is much harder to do if we were to meet physically. Uh, I would have liked to see you in person, but uh, thank you very much for a wonderful opportunity. So uh, now it's my turn to really thank you for a uh, fascinating talk uh, and your deep uh, principle thinking about difficult questions and, uh, and your courage in addressing them, uh, frankly, and, and looking at a lot of uh, causal forces and, and then uh, trying to take action as well. So thank you for being with us and raising all those deep issues. Uh, this was fascinating. Thank you as well to uh, Incho and to Saya and to all of you who asked questions and for the great audience that we had today. So with this, uh, we're concluding the event. And thank you, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>